Colin, Martin, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, the next half hour I'll be here not as the GNU Radio guy, not as the Pybombs guy, I'll be um, the software group manager um, at Edis Research. And so what's up with this title? Um, the first part of the title is um, something that um, our hardware engineer, Shu Li, who is the, um, like the lead designer on, <laughs> on the M310 said, like I was, I was in Robin's Cube and um, Shu comes up with the, the new case for the M310 and he holds it and says, push the button. Like it was uh, this button. And um, so Robin pushes the button and nothing happens because it wasn't actually connected and he says, you have turned on the future. And, you know, we thought oh, this is such a great inspirational quote and I'm just gonna keep it around. But the actual useful title for this presentation is Updates from Edis Research R&D. Because for this talk, I decided not to, you know, do like a product pitch or talk about like something that I worked on. I just wanted to give sort of an all around update of what we've been doing. And um, I've also tried to keep it like at 20 minutes because I'm sure there'll be questions that I wanna, you know, have some time to answer. <clears throat> so, um, first thing I wanna talk about is the N310, as you, uh, might have guessed, um, and maybe you've already seen it at our expo hall. Uh, if not, you should go down and take a look. Um, this is sort of the next user app that we're working on, um, and you know we're already um, quite far in the in the process. And um, I'm not going to sort of go into the feature list here because Manuel did a great job of that on Monday, but I sort of want to go into the engineering challenges that we faced as we were working on this. So. Um, you know, if you look at the box, you think, oh, well, this looks kind of like an X310. It's sort of an iteration of that. It has, you know, more antenna inputs and outputs. But if you look at the internals, it's actually a very different device, very different architecture. And just a couple of examples of things that stand out is you have a, um, you have a zinc in there. So it's an embedded, uh, you know, Linux running on that, it's unlike the X310, but it's more like the E310, for example, in that respect. But then we also have SFPs, so for high data rate in and outputs going straight to the FPGA. So again, that's more like the X310, but now we have to sort of marry these concepts, but we also have an RJ45, so, and of course the Axie 4 um, you know, internal bus on the, on the die itself. So we have like all these transports that we need to deal with um, transparently because you know, we don't wanna sort of dump the effort of dealing with those onto the user. <coughs> um, we have a whole bunch of conf uh, peripherals that are sort of all controlled through Linux, which is also slightly different than we've done it on, say, the X310. Um, the, uh, all the like, AD converters, for example, DA converters, they're now on the daughter board. That's also different from like, the X310 design, so um, that means the FPGA is now dependent, like the actual image is now dependent on the, on the daughter board that you will plug in. So these are all things that sort of slightly like, shuffle it all up, and um, we sort of have to go through, and through these and figure out how to solve them. And I've got a couple of challenges on the next couple of slides that I want to highlight. So um, we, you know, we are hoping to sell uh, you know, plenty of these. That's, that's obviously always the, um, you know, the, the hope uh, that we have. But um, if we want to do that, we have to make sure that once we deploy usurps that they're actually useful and usable. And that means once they're in sort of data center style racks, they have to be you know, um, solid and robust. And the marketing term for this is uh, RASM. And if you look up RASM on the internet, you'll find a three or four different you know, expansions to that acronym. But inside National Instruments, at least, it stands for reliability, availability, serviceability, and manageability. But just think um, of plenty of devices that are deployed in racks. Like, without having to walk up to them, you want to make sure that they keep running, that they do the right thing, that you know what's going on. And <clears throat> so that's the first thing we had to take way more seriously than in the past going into the design of the product. And that's, just not, that's not just a um, thing that we can put on our brochures and you know, the marketing team can go to the customers and uh, um, you know, advertise as a new feature. It's also something that we actually actively need while we're developing. So if you sort of have a rack of usurps here and you're sort of developing on all of these and you don't actually have anything that is remotely categorizable as a RASM feature, then you end up doing stuff like, you know, like typing out really long uh, commands um, to sort of reproducibly run the same configuration on each of these systems. And, and I, was, I was really cool, uh, um, uh, glad to see Hollywood up because like what we do is, looks a lot like that except we're actually typing ourselves. If you do something like Tmox, you, so you, can, you can like write code on like six different devices at once and it looks kind of cool. But it's actually also a really useful feature. Of course that doesn't scale. But that's sort of just a reminder to us as developers that um, you know, remote, like RASM features and multi-device uh, configurations are really, really important. <clears throat> and of course, um, 
unlike the X310, like updating these devices is also more complicated because on the X310, um, if you're aware of the product, like it, it had a big FPGA, but updating it was as simple as loading a new bitstream and it got stored on um, persistent memory on the device, but that was pretty much it. These devices have a, a you know, full-blown operating system with hundreds of configuration files and it also has a microcontroller that needs to be updated. You know, not, not even speaking of the FPGA yet, so we need a solid solution how to do that. And um, one of the solutions that we'll be definitely be support, supporting is called Menda. Um, we've been playing around with that, and it's sort of a web-based front end. It looks like I've just these are all just screenshots that I made. Um, so you can see like, oh, these are all your devices on your on your web, and you can sort of pick one out. It'll give you some more details about its particular configuration, and then you can say, yeah, I want to deploy um, an update to like a fleet or a subfleet of these devices, and um, yeah, and this is. A, um, you know, much nicer than having to manually update files or like type, you know, into 40 Tmux consoles at the same time. <clears throat> um, we generally try not to, you know, force a particular tool onto users. So, like, if you don't like that, you won't have to use it. But this is sort of a suggested way of doing things, and it's been very useful for us um, in the sort of rapid iteration phase where we, you know, have um, updates to the file system on a regular basis. So this is just a stock photo of a bunch of X310s, but it sort of highlights another problem that we have is, you know, we want to sell lots of usurps, um, and we want to make them useful to you guys. Um, but if you're now managing a mob of usurps instead of just one or two, you have to, like the individual device has to pull their own weight a little bit more than was true in the past. So um, how do we do that? Well, the um, N310 has, a, as I said earlier, has a full-blown Linux running on it. So how about we let that Linux do some of the work instead of trying to have to do it from like the controlling uh, you know, master process. So for example, the, the guy running your HD. And um, yeah, that's another thing that we wanted to take into account. And then finally, um, these, so out of those challenges that I'm highlighting here, network mode was probably the most requested um, feature on the E310. Now if you're not familiar with the E310, you might have seen it. It's sort of a little embedded user up like this. Um, and one thing it doesn't do brilliantly, I would say, is um, be usable in the same way that an N200 is. So you, you know, if you plug it in, then um, you get a lower data rate out of it than um, like on, on an N210, for, for example. And that's because all the data gets shuffled through the ARM core, which is, you know, it's an ARM Cortex A9. It's not really very fast. Now on the E3, sorry, on the N210, we also have an ARM Cortex A9, but we also do not want to have this problem. So um, we want to be able to run it like a, an X310, like an N200, but also like an E310 where everything's running you know, embedded locally and might maybe use RFNOC to uh, do you know, offload acceleration. Like all of these um, modes need to be available, but as the guy who's in charge of the software, I'm also you know, like putting my foot down and having two different versions of UHD to run. So they, are, they, they can only be one version of UHD and it has to solve all of this. It just has to compile either on that platform or on this uh, you know, desktop, and it should just work. <clears throat> how do we, so how do we solve all of that? Um, so for the N310, we have, a slightly, um, we have a slight change in architecture, which is um, called NPM, the Module Peripheral Manager. And so we took all of these uh, requirements, sort of boiled it down, and we end up with this new piece of software called NPM that is locally running on the device. And um, UHD will then actually talk to NPM for a lot of the things. <clears throat> So sort of to give you a general overview, so say you're running um, a computer and then connect through 10 gigabit ethernet to the device. So you're running some user application, maybe GNU Radio, hopefully GNU Radio, on your computer. Under the hood, you will be talking to UHD. And that's, from your point of view, that's it. Like, you know, UHD can do whatever it wants to control the device. Now on the device itself, we do not only have the FPGA bitstream, like in the past, but we also now have this service called NPM running. Um, and it'll handle a lot of the heavy lifting. And you know, we split it up into two parts. That actually makes the individual part easier to, to develop, to implement, more robust, et cetera. <clears throat> um, now what if we want to run um, you know, just embedded? It's, it's exactly the same, so there's no difference. We, we just compile um, UHD for the ARM target instead of like x86 or whatever your desktop might be. And in that case, um, even your user application would also run on the zinc. But fundamentally, nothing changes. So how do these um, buses look like? 
So obviously, when you call into UHD, it's just your vanilla C++ API, or it could be some other API, like Python or, or C. But then UHD has um, two connections to the device, and it doesn't matter if it's UHD is running on the device itself or remotely, and one of them is an RPC connection to NPM. And basically, that's where we do a lot of the um, control and command that is not meant to be timing critical, super high speed. So, um, for example, if we want to change the reference clock um, source from external to internal or GPS or something like that, we literally do that. We just say, please change your reference clock to whatever it is, and um, NPM will then take care of things under the hood. Whereas in the past, we would you know, have to know which chips to modify, like which spy rights to initiate, et cetera, et cetera. So that knowledge is now separately um, stored somewhere else. And of course, speaking to the FPGA, we have a direct chatter connection like we do on X310. And in case you're not familiar with that term, it's just the uh, protocol that we use on the um, you know, generation three devices for data IO and, and control and command and all of that. And those are things that we can do both at high speed and at timing critical um, you know, junctions of the code. And then of course, NPM running on the same device uh, uses an Axie interconnect to speak to the FPGA itself um, because it's, it's always local. <clears throat> and um, as we're sort of developing, um, this is really, really useful, not just you know, for the final product, but also as, as developers, because you know, what if the UHD guy isn't finished with his part? It doesn't matter, because like, the NPM guy might already be, be finished, and we can do fun things like this, where we have, a, we have sort of a, a command line interface to sort of the lower level commands of the device, and, um, <clears throat> and writing code like this, like a, like a command line interface, is, you know, it's like half an hour of work with like modern Python modules. It's really, really fantastic. So you can just like say, okay, like, I, I'd like to connect to that device. I'd like to toggle like a spy write uh, on like that synthesizer to see what, what hap what's happening. Um, without you know having to run, I don't know, like all of GNU Radio, for example, because that might you know just take too long to compile or whatever. <clears throat> and if you have stuff like this, then um, you you will just make your team more effective because um, the the fact that we can now use Python for even you know hardware controls, which a lot of people when I tell them about this say, "What? Well, that's crazy." And then you know as you think about it, you think, "No, actually that makes sense." Um, Python does a much better job at doing the garbage collection and running stably than if you, you write low-level C where you can easily mess up like a, you know, a, a, a malloc or a double delete or something like that. <clears throat> so this is a really, really nice uh, way of you know, sort of separating tasks and then doing things in the right domain at the right place instead of having to build this one giant UHD application. So that's uh, all from the NC10. I'm going to go through a couple of other things just um, as I as I finish uh, this presentation. So first thing um, that's, that's personally interesting to me was that we were switching to C++11 for the next UHD release. Um, that started out as sort of a minor thing that I thought would be cool. Turns out to be extremely useful. Um, I, I, I strongly believe that C++ is an incomplete language until it reaches C++14 everywhere, but C++11 is, is really, really useful. And it's like you easily pick up stuff very quickly. And I just recently banged out this code, and then looking at it, I realized like like, like two thirds of the lines wouldn't even compile, like in, even in a like C plus plus ninety eight compiler. But it's just it's just so much so much easier to to write stuff out. Um, this is really minor thing, but I want to mention it just because we've got a lot of questions about this. We actually, we have changed the logging API, and the only reason I like. Normally, I'd say, like, who cares about the logging API? But a lot of people were actually using the logging API to figure out if there were underruns or overruns on your device. It's really the wrong way to do this. So um, we sort of resisted, like, adding a feature to the new logging API to figure out if you have underruns or overruns because we have actual APIs to, to handle that. And um, just sort of a quick timeline. Um, these kind of things will be happening on the 3.11 release, which will not happen at the same time as a product release. Um, because we really want to sort of clean up um, the 310 release that did have some issues that I, you know, I, I will admit that we introduced a couple of issues with that release, and we sort of just want to clean it up. Look, look for a 311 release about one to two months out from now. And we've also get a lot of questions about the long-term support branch. Will it stick around for a while? The answer is yes. 3.9 long-term support branch will be around for a while. Sort of a high-level item I want to, sort of bigger item I want to pick out of the UHD updates is the Python API. Um, because we've got a lot of good feedback for that. Um, so Nathan already spoke about his Python API for UHD, which um, I'm glad there's like two approaches to this, so we can sort of have them 
uh, go at each other and see which one is more successful. The one that um, we released a while back is um, meant to sort of mirror the C++ API, so all tutorials and um, teaching materials around um, UHD, C++ API will sort of one-to-one -one map into Python, um, and it uses Boost Python under the hood. <clears throat> and um, as I was writing this, I, I accidentally ran over this uh, graph at the bottom right. I don't know if you can see this. This might be a little small, but um, the, uh, so this is a Stack Overflow article that projected which programming languages will be popular. And, and at the bottom right, it's 2020. Like, the assumption is that Python will be, by, by a wide margin, the most popular language. So if you're not doing Python these days for this kind of application, you're definitely doing it wrong. And Brent Stapleton, I don't know if he's in the audience right now, is, there he is, is uh, going to be uh, maintaining that API, and he will actually do a lightning talk on it on Friday. So if you want to try it out, go to GitHub, check out the branch. Um, leave some comments on uh, on GitHub. We have a spe specific issue for that. And um, if you do, you will find that you can write stuff like this really easily. So this is a full UHD application that'll um, receive a limited number of samples, and you can just put it immediately into some you know Python-based processing. And a really cool way to do this is in a Jupyter notebook. I love this. This is sort of a perfect complement to the GNU radio style, you know, where you have like infinite streaming, um, real-time processing, and this sort of more offline processing where you can use Jupyter notebooks and Matplotlib or whatever to um, to do quick offline analysis of signals. And if you're in the teaching business, I, I, I you know, I would have loved to have this when I was still teaching, um, you know, radio classes. <clears throat> The final thing I want to talk about, how am I doing for time, Ben? Is it? OK, perfect. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is something else that I get asked a lot, is what happens when people post a bug on the Edis Research GitHub? Because what you'll see is something like this, or in most cases at least, that you know, I, will, I or someone else will make a comment along the lines of, oh yeah, oh, this is actually a bug. We'll take care of it. Or you know, maybe it's not. But let's say this was actually a bug, like, like in this example. Um, you will find that I, I, I might close the issue without actually submitting a fix. And why is that? That's just something I just wanted to clear out and have you know, out in the open. Um, if someone posts a, a bug on the public GitHub issue, we usually pull it internal, um, which, which by internal, we, I mean our, our, our you know, non-public issue tracker, and then work on it from there. And sort of just to sort of avoid confusion on our own end, we will close the original bug um, because, we, because we are tracking it elsewhere. I know that you can't see that, so I just wanted to give you a quick update what we actually do in that case. So um, in this case, the bug was posted on July 31st, and then something happened. And then August 7th, um, like with a series of other commits, you know, the, 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 the fix went out. So um, what happened in the meantime? And really, nothing special. There's, there's nothing, nothing secret here. We have our continuous integration system that we run. So we use BuildBot at Edis, and we have you know, a bunch of hardware that is connected up to various computers that runs various uh, kinds of tests. We do code reviews. And um, we also use the same tools as GNU does in this case, coincidentally, which is just the, the GitHub code review feature. We do internal tests. And once you know, the fix is deemed uh, you know, suitable, it goes out. That, that's all there is. There's no, no black magic. And in this case, you know, like July 31st to August 7th, I think is a decent response time. Sometimes it takes longer, and I do apologize for that. But um, you know, your bug will sort of get put in the queue with like with other bugs um, as we sort of work on them. If it takes very long, we will sometimes publish an intermediate sort of public um, branch that is you know not main or master um, to make things more available available more quickly, like we did with the Python API branch. Um, but you know, in this case, we didn't because didn't actually take that long. Final word of advice, um, and I feel like I'm giving away trade secrets here, <laughs> a competitive advantage, but probably not at this point. If you ever want to get in the hardware development business, well, <laughs> good luck. It's a, it's a tough field. But um, if you do use GNU Radio, you, like, this, this really makes no sense to use anything else at this point in time. Um, you, you have so many you know, visualizations and DSP tool blocks available. And that by itself is not a unique feature of GNU Radio. You have that in other frameworks. But the ease of modification the, is, is just a tremendous feature. So I mean, as you're debugging hardware, you want to like have a GUI button that when you click it will initiate a, I don't know, um, 
a GPIO toggle somewhere else just to see what's happening. Like, no other tool gives you that flexibility where you can throw this all together within, you know, sometimes a minute if you're lucky. Sometimes not even that if you have, uh, have a way of you know, exposing um, low-level API straight into GRC. <clears throat> so this is just sort of a personal recommendation of mine. Um, use GNU Radio, you'll love it. Okay, so before I take questions, I do want to like use the, abuse the <laughs> time I have on, on the stage to just thank you all for coming to this conference. Um, it's, it's fantastic to see how GRCon has um, grown over the years and then you know, Ben's uh, organization has been like, amazing. Um, but like, the fact that you're all here means that you all care about GNU Radio and you know, I'd, li I'd like to personally thank you all for that. Um, and I hope you have some, some questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Do we have any questions for Martin from the audience? Just All right. Know. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we, we're now uh, heading into a lunch break. So as a reminder, um, this lunch break is the last exposition of the conference. Uh, so Edis Research, uh, Diamond Sponsor, all of our other sponsors, uh, the booths, and the poster session, this is your last chance to go see them and talk to the people that are, that are there and want to tell you about things. So please head there. All the food is there. We pick back, here, pick back up here at 1 o'clock. Uh, also, one last item. Remember, this, the last item today is the panel session. If you have not given me your questions for the panel session, now is your last chance. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>